The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, everybody. Christine Westerlin here from Illinois Association of Community Action Agencies. And Susan Wilson from CEFS in Effingham. And welcome back to the Wednesday Roma webinar. It's too bad that Roma doesn't start with a W, Susan, because then we could have, you know, such a beautiful alliteration going on. We'll have to give that some thought. <laughs> uh, we'll have to. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm so happy. I was going to say so sorry you're here with all of us, um, but really, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Um, it's 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 been a long time since I've been with people, so forgive me. Um, so happy that you're here with us this morning um, on this Roma webinar. And um, if you've been with us for the past five webinars, this is webinar number six. Um, thank and you I, for joining us. Yes, absolutely. And thanks to Susan. Um, you know, I think I've told this story, but I noticed on the first Roma webinar she had signed up for it, and then I immediately got a hold of her and said, "Hey, you want to help me out?" And you've been a great partner and collaborator ever since, Susan. So thank you for for joining me in this. Um, I enjoy working with you, Christine, and it's good to get the word out that Roma is not so scary. It's just a documentation and a validation and a roadmap of everything you already do. Yeah, that, and that's exactly right. Um, and I think, Susan, being both an uh, implementer and a trainer, I think you bring a unique perspective um, to this work and really can kind of look at, you know, not only at the training aspect of it, but really how do you dive into the implementation of Roma? And I think that's such a key piece for um, every community action, action agency, not just in Illinois, but across the country um, for the value of that Roma professional at the organization. And I realize um, sometimes it sounds as if we are running an extended Roma commercial. Um, in many ways, we are um, because we understand and see the value of Roma and want to encourage all of you to you know, to jump on with us because, and, and wave that banner high, because really this is how we tell our story of success at Community Action. So we'll go ahead and get ourselves started. Um, we are now moving into a theory of change, um, or I should say Roma Next Generation. So Roma Ge Next Generation is really the modernization of Roma. It's adding in um, elements of uh, change and data and taking a deeper dive into the work that we do in community action. Um, we just want to, uh, again, acknowledge and, and, and uh, thank DCEO for their support of this webinar. Um, without them, uh, we, we wouldn't be sitting here and talking with all of you and sharing this information. This is that they um, are also great promoters of Roma, and I know that they want all of you to become Roma practitioners as well. Um, once again, there are our mugs. Um, I am really looking forward to a day when my hair will be that short again. <laughs> yeah, I'm anxious for a salon visit myself. <laughs> but that's okay. I understand uh, why we can't. Um, so as we, as is our custom, um, whenever we kick off one of these webinars, we want to say together this promise. It's important for us to hold these words up, um, to think that this is what we do. We do this across the country, across the thousand uh, plus community action agencies in this, in this country and territories. And so let's say this together. You could either say it silently or out loud. So community action yeah. changes people's Change lives, lives. Embodies, embodies the spirit the of hope. Spirit of hope. Improves communities, improves communities and makes America, makes America a better place, a better to, place live. to live. We care about, we the, care entire about the entire community and we are dedicated, we are dedicated to, helping to helping people help themselves, help themselves and, themselves and, and each, each other. other. So as we get started, uh, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. It will be made available on the ICA YouTube channel. Once it is, uh, I have to download it and repackage it and send it off, but hopefully it'll be up there either today or tomorrow if you wanna share it with your peers. Um, also, uh, please use your dashboard to ask any questions that you may have. Um, we're happy to respond to your questions. And also we will be putting in continuous plugs for Roma training at your agency once we reopen. Um, and these are not, these are shameless plugs, correct, Susan? Shameless plugs. Shameless and plugs. Frequent. Yes. <laughs> frequent shameless plugs. 
And I think I think a lot of this is really predicated on this idea that we want um, the entire state to embed Roma practices into the work that you're doing, because this is really a great time um, to tell the story. I know that uh, many of you are um, really those first responders to many of the issues that have emerged through this pandemic. And this is a great time for you to reflect, even though you're busy, I know you're busy, but to reflect on the work that you're doing, the outcomes that you're achieving and really tell that deeper story of community action. So uh, as we get started as well, I just want to give a shout out to NASCASP. That's the National Association of, uh, of State Community Action Programs. I'm not quite, that's not quite right, NASCASP. Um, I, anyway, if, I, if, if it pops into my head the, in the, uh, the getting those words in the right order, I will correct myself later. <laughs> Um, and also the work of Barbara Mooney um, and those at the, uh, the Roma National Peer-to-Peer. -peer. Um, much of this information that we're presenting today is gleaned from there. So a definition of what Roma Next Generation is, um, it's really a focus on uh, continuous quality improvement um, because really it's important for us to measure, analyze, and communicate what we're doing, what our performance looks like. Again, we've, we, uh, Roma is, is performance management. We look at performance from many different perspectives when we engage and speak about Roma and use Roma. So this is a way for us to consider how we can improve. We have agencies, honestly, that are now using that uh, quality improvement as a job title um, within their agencies. And it moves us a step closer to embedding Roma into all of the practices that we have at the Community Action Agency. And also, um, Roma Next Generation really kind of helps us shift uh, to continuous learning, this culture of continuous learning, if you will, um, rather than a compliance and reporting culture. And I think that's kind of a key shift. And to think about that for just a moment, um, that's that's why we're here today. You know, this is, you know, it's not only continuous learning, but we want you to go beyond compliance go beyond the check mark, or as I often say, go beyond just counting the no's. We really want to know the story of what's happened. And again, we're elevating this idea of story because it is so important to the work that we do. And then ultimately, if we can really share what our robust results are for people with low incomes and for communities served, then we're telling that story. We are, we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. We are fulfilling that promise of community action, and we're demonstrating that we can get this work done. And we know that we can. We know that we're really good at it, but oftentimes we have fallen short on telling that story of our success. So this is where we really do focus on data and results. Um, this is a little um, graph that I found on the NASCASP website, and it kind of compares um, when, and if you look at the two columns, one is now. So this was done pre-Roma Next Gen. We have now are in the process of embedding Roma Next Gen. But if you'll see a couple of things that really kind of stand out here um, is it's a real focus on data, a big focus on data. And so, under Roma Next Gen, we're trying to um, embed these this infrastructure of multi-layered analysis. Yeah, Christine, two things I really like about this chart. Um, it shows that we are accountable for our work, and it specifically allows us to report our work over time, because it can take years to take a family from vulnerable to thriving, or it could take years to bring in subsidized housing, or to bring in an industry that'll hire hundreds. And so this allows for us to uh, show our progress over time. And again, be accountable for what we do. That's, that's exactly right. So, so this whole walk that we've been taking over the past few years, the organizational standards, um, was a key step in that direction towards Roma Next Generation. The adding in of community indicators into the CSBG annual report, that's a big step towards Roma Next Generation because we know that we're impacting the family, but we're also impacting and changing the community. So it's important that we think about that. And because um, we've become, oh, what's the word I want? I think that we have, we have become more sophisticated perhaps in our outlook at what community action 
is and can be, that we also, as a part of this process, got clearance from the Office of Management and Budget, um, which is an important step really to uh, kind of solidifying our role across the country in what we do in community action. All right. So why do it? Um, so the question is, how does Roma Next Generation fit into Roma? And this really is an opportunity for us to um, modernize our data practices, um, to modernize the infrastructure and our capacity for analysis. Um, I know that uh, many of you are aware that we have Carly um, Wiltsey at the association who is really specializing in data. Um, for us. She's presented some webinars and trainings on data and will continue to do so, so we have a deeper understanding of data. And it really positions community action as a model of national performance management. So this is something that, that we've, you know, we've been working towards really since 1964. And as we've as we've grown and learned over time, this is this is the pathway to telling our story of success. Yeah, this Roma cycle represents the work we, you and us, we already do well. What impact do we want to have and how do we want to get there? When we analyze our results, do we make changes or do we at least note what is working well and how we continue it? Okay. So today we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about a theory of change, and uh, it is currently not yet a requirement um, of the work that we do in community action, but you'll notice I said yet and I underscored it in my brain. <laughs> um, because I think this is something that we will have to do. And I can tell you that many agencies are, have taken on a theory of change. Um, again, it's something that um, the Roma professional, if you have one on staff, can help um, at the agency to develop this. There are tools online um, that can be used to help develop this theory of change. But what is it exactly? What's well, really kind of a, it's a conscious visualization exercise, right? What's possible and what's probable. And I think that that's something that uh, we're, we're so used in community action to, you know, filling out charts and using paperwork that this is a visual orientation for what it is that we do. And I think that's important that we kind of look at our information and our and, uh, and our hopes from that perspective, because it tells, I think it tells a beautiful story. It can put together a set of assumptions that are made, assumptions about mission, assumptions about services and strategies, um, and projections. What do we know about poverty and what do we know about the community? So it can become a change map. It's linking together those services and strategies to stated results or goals. And it also is a process tool that allows you to see that bigger picture of how we're going to meet family goals, agency goals, and community goals. Yes, later in the webinar, we have a few slides of different theories of change. It's a much broader viewpoint that takes, to, it takes into account the entire agency, um, and it'll, make, it'll be clear as we go on. So um, because we want to kind of try to kind of fill in some of the gaps in your understanding of what a theory of change is, and there's a lot of um, different uh, definitions of the theory of change, but this is one that I think that NASCAS put out there that is, pr is pretty clear. And again, it's a bit of a restatement of what we just went over, but um, a theory of change is the articulation of underlying beliefs and assumptions that guide the selection of service delivery strategies that are critical for producing change and improvement. It is a framework that addresses the systems and activities that support the outcomes to be accomplished. All right, let's notice the important words in this slide. We've got articulation, strategies, framework, outcomes. So simplify your documentation of services and results by using Roma and having staff trained on Roma principles. Shameless plug. <laughs> Maybe we should start counting them. <laughs> I thought about that, but I didn't know if it was number two or three. So, okay. We'll say it's three. Okay. Okay. Shameless plug number three. Um, I'm, Susan, were you done? I'm sorry. Um, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, 
so this is something that perhaps you have seen um, um, in various presentations over the past couple of years, but this is the Community Action, the National Community Action Network's theory of change. And this was, a, 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 I don't want to call it a document, I guess it's a theory of change that was done in collaboration with many people, NASCAS, CAP, um, many community action agencies played a role in this. I actually got to play a minor role in this as well um, to really see what this looks like. And, and if you'll see here, this is a bit of, this is not a bit, it is an, a construct that is very deliberate because we see at the very top, we see the three national community action goals. And these are goals that we are hopefully very familiar with. Um, these are goals that you're using if you are part of the CSBG annual report process, and I know that many of you are. Um, so we see goal number one, our individuals and families with low income are stable and achieve economic security. Number two, goal two, communities where people with low incomes live are healthy and offer economic opportunity. And then goal three, People with low incomes are engaged and active in building opportunities in communities. Those are three aspirational goals and goals that you currently are working within and perhaps trying to um, design programs, strategies, services and strategies that help fulfill these goals. If you don't have this posted in each of your offices, please do so. It shows our common goals, our principles, our services. It shows our operations all in one place. And attached to this webinar is a handout that you can print off because it really does um, put everybody on the same page. It, it, it really does. And I think a couple of things just to, I think to point out, um, we see at the bottom, um, of this theory of change is kind of this concrete slab or a marble slab, perhaps it is. Um, but it's really, uh, that's, that's the support system. That's the national network of over 1,000 high-performing agencies, associations, state offices, and federal partners supported by CSBG that mobilize communities to fight poverty. So there's, there's a lot of good, solid support. And if you move up from the bottom, you'll see where the agency really fits in here. What are the core principles that the agency believes in? Complexity, you, know, you understand the complexity of poverty, that you support family stability as a foundation, that you advocate for systemic change, that you pursue positive individual family and community level change. We understand that you have to maximize the involvement of people with low incomes. That includes representation on your tripartite boards and you leverage state, federal and community resources. This is um, a time of great leveraging going on. Um, we see so many opportunities for funding coming out. We're seeing uh, many agencies are experiencing an influx of money or hopefully they are. And this is a way to help articulate to these funders um, exactly what it is that the agencies believe in. And then if you go over to the next blue box, uh, that's performance management. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about ROMA. We're talking about accountability measures, performance indicators. Um, what are some of the uh, organizational standards that, that you're using nationally, but perhaps you have been able to embed your own organizational standards. So we can tell that story of how well we're doing and what a difference what we make. And then in the middle, you'll see the services and strategies, and these are the, the CSBG domains that we're always operating um, within and reporting on. So part of this um, webinar is today is to really encourage you to start thinking about a theory of change and to get, and to get started on that theory of change. But you want to first think um, about these two questions. Um, how will this agency, meaning your agency, affect the movement of, of people with low incomes towards stability and economic security? And how will it affect the well-being of the community? Those are two critical questions that we have to consider when you're thinking about a theory of change. All right, let's go to the next slide. Where should we start? <clears throat> Um, well, you know what, Christine, uh, shameless plug number four, All right. having staff trained in Roma is a really great beginning. We can speak to your whole agency or better yet, 
uh, <clears throat> I prefer to speak separately to different programs, uh, you know, just the housing or just the LIHEAP, uh, because that way my focus is timely, relevant, applicable to all who attend. Um, of course, it might be uh, more feasible to speak to the whole agency, and I'm happy to do that. But additionally, you as an agency are encouraged to have a member of your own staff trained as a Roma implementer. And CEFS just got their second implementer. Besides me, my supervisor, Cindy Meyer, is now a Roma implementer. I'll put a shameless plug in for Cindy. Um, and your, your in-house Roma implementer will be able to guide your strategies, decisions, documents, and, and moving forward, the Roma training addresses, if, if we have the full day training, as we should, because what we're doing right now is a brief overview in these webinars, but a full day training addresses missions, assumptions, theories of change, uh, documentation, and it really is well worth it to um, get the staff focused and uh, working together. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think the the two of the key plans that we need to really, you know, give a shout out to are are the community action plan, which you start obviously with your needs assessment, and then the agency strategic plan. And um, this is something, these are two documents that really you need in hand to work on a theory of change because the strategic plan should lay out the long range, the longer view, the longer look down the road, what is it? What are our intentions for the future, and what do we need to have in place to make those intentions come to fruition? Um, the community action plan. We know it is a it is a designated document that explicitly describes what it is that you're going to do for the families and the communities in your service area, and it should also be an articulation of change as you're moving forward with this, your work. And it wouldn't be a Roma webinar without the Roma cycle. So here it is again for us to see. And as you know, in the past webinars, we have gone through this cycle, um, really working on the importance of each of these um, values that are within this cycle. But the theory of change starts here. It starts with planning. It starts with the mission statement and your assessment data. So we're going to just kind of uh, shift a little bit here and talk about poverty for uh, the next couple of slides, because I think it's important for us to kind of connect back to how is it that we view change. We know that we are structured around change, especially for people who are experiencing poverty. So a couple of the questions that you would want to start with are what needs that have been identified do you think you're able to address? You know, when you've collected all that data for your needs assessments, you know, then you begin kind of creating your buckets, right? Your buckets of need, or, you know, you categorize them. And then are you able to address them? And then once you have done that sorting process, then how will you address specific needs that align with the overall anti-poverty mission of the CSBG funding? All right, let's go on to the next slide, the agency mission statement. So we, discuss, we discussed this in our very first webinar. Your statement should just say who you are and what is your goal. Uh, mission statement contains the essence of who you are as an agency. After reading your mission statement, someone should know what your agency believes about poverty and what your long-term goals, what changes will you achieve. And anyone should also know who you serve and if you have connections with others in the community, our, our, uh, um, our network of, of services. Mm -hmm. Yes, so right, that's that, that's that collaboration and partnership piece. So um, as Susan referenced that, yes, we did talk about mission in our very first webinar together. So we're gonna refresh on mission for a moment. And if we remember correctly, the lessons that we learned from Peter Drucker, the first thing that you have to tend to of his five questions is what is the mission? So I found a mission statement um, from a community action agency that I was unfamiliar with and thought, okay, uh, let's break this down into the four elements that every mission statement should have. So that first element is population. 
Um, so let me just start and read this whole mission statement to you, and then we'll, we'll work through this. I, I got a little ahead of myself, which is not surprising. That's how I operate. Um, so WISCAT's mission is to promote community development in Warm Springs by empowering individuals and groups of people to realize their potential, become self-sufficient, and affect positive change for themselves, their families, and their community. So we first work with identifying what the population is. Well, this looks like it's very centric to Warm Springs. So that's our population. Sounds like a nice place. <laughs> it does sound like a lovely place, doesn't it? Um, as opposed to Hot Springs, which is another <laughs> city. There's probably a cold spring somewhere, but I'll stop. Somewhere, yeah. I'll stop right now. Um, so what are some of the services that are provided? So we see that by empowering individuals and groups of people to realize their potential. The next part that we talk about are what are the relationships? We see promote community development. And that sort of gets us to relationship. It's, it's enough for a mission statement, perhaps. And then what are the outcomes? Become self-reliant and affect positive change for themselves, their family, and their community. This is kind of that whole notion of self-determination that we discussed, Susan, in that first webinar. Yes. Um, when we do the full Roma training, we can go much more in depth about mission statements, um, but your mission statement should address all four facets, population, services, relationships, and outcomes. The trick is to be as thorough as you can by being as brief and concise as you can. Um, it should fit on a business card or on a t-shirt um, and, and not six point font either. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so right, so Drucker's guidance is uh, short and sharply focused. And I would say that this mission statement does fit that criteria. It does, it's a pretty good one. So if we're going to then think about assumptions, what does the agency assume about poverty in the community? Let's go back to it. Wait, All right, so wait, wait, wait. I don't, okay. I hit the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. We're patient. Oh, we're getting, we're going to have to get more patient here. Okay. <laughs> I apologize, folks, but you are getting a sneak peek. And it's not a It's a long, preview. That's it's right. A preview. It's a huge preview. Or spoilers. I don't know. Spoiler alert. Come on. I'm so close. I'm so close. And <laughs> I honestly didn't touch anything. I apologize, everyone. I'm going to try one more time. And I don't know what happened there. Okay. Okay. Whew. Thank you for bearing oh, with me, awesome. everyone. <laughs> Now we're on assumptions. I don't know WSCAT's um, agency at all, but looking at their mission, these are the things that I can assume. I can make these assumptions based merely on their mission statement. Um, I can assume that the community isn't fully developed because otherwise they wouldn't try to develop it. I can assume that people in that community have not reached their full potential yet. I can assume that the people of Warm Springs are not self-reliant yet, and I can assume that empowering the people will promote community development, and I assume that the agency believes it can empower people. Those are the assumptions I can make by their mission statement. So if the public or a stakeholder were to look at your agency or your program's mission statement, what assumptions could they make about you? Yeah, and I think I think that's a, you know, everything that you said was so powerful because that's a lot to pull out of a mission statement. And I think the one of the most important things we need to hold on to with that mission statement is that you're using this mission statement every day. You're embedding this mission statement in your documentation. So it is understanding your mission statement, thinking about what are some of the assumptions you pull out of this mission statement 
And those assumptions are really connected to making change. Okay, now that you've seen all the other slides. <laughs> We're done. Let's see, it's not, of course it's, it's not allowing me to, there we go. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes um, kind of circling back to poverty, because if we're going to consider um, our theory of change, our change is really always going to be focused on how are we making an impact on families and communities, individuals and communities um, that are experiencing poverty. So we'll look at a couple of definitions of poverty. The one that is most common is the one, of course, from Webster's Dictionary. Um, which is the state of one who lacks a usual or socially acceptable amount of money or material possessions. That's pretty straightforward. Or we can look at this, this different uh, definition by uh, Professor Peter Townsend. He is the leading authority um, uh, in poverty in the United Kingdom. That um, And he wrote, when someone's resources are so seriously below those commanded by the average individual or family that are that they are, in effect, excluded from ordinary living patterns, customs, and activities. That's pretty powerful. It is. It's, it's more thorough and it's more thought-provoking, I think, than Webster's. But Webster's is clear and simple. And you know what? Keeping it simple is sometimes a good thing, too. And I think that was Noah Webster's um, goal, was to provide simple definitions to words. So, and this goes on, um, it really is about exclusion. And these are, again, this is, comes from um, Dr. Townsend, where he wrote, goes on uh, to write that individuals, families, and groups in the population can be said to be in poverty when they lack the resources to obtain the type of diet, participate in the activities, and have the living conditions and amenities which are customary or at least widely encouraged or approved in the societies in which they belong. Again, there's, there's so much in there. I mean, it, it's talking about access to food. We know that people who experience low income typically live in food deserts. Um, what about participating in activities? Um, one of the most heartbreaking um, things that um, Donna Beagle teaches us is that when kids are in school and with their peers, one thing that you do is that you celebrate birthdays and there are birthday parties and typically, Oftentimes, if you are a child um, in a family that experiences poverty, then if you're invited to a birthday party, there's a probability that you may not get to go or your child cannot go to that party or you have to give something up in order to allow that child to go to that party and participate because that means that involves taking a gift um, that may not be in your budget. So again, these are some of the things that we really have to kind of think about and balance when we are thinking about what poverty looks like, that it really is a place of social exclusion. And this is another piece of it too, is that your neighborhood really matters, um, that, that there is a correlation between where you have lived as a child and your opportunities to achieve economic su success as an adult. Um, Christine, I've done some research on this because your neighborhood does matter and something the agencies can do um, either themselves or in correlation with other agencies is enhance social mixes by providing opportunities like summer camp scholarships, after school homework clubs, summer lunch programs, educating the parents. Those are all proven ways to reduce the effects of living in low-income neighborhoods and increase the chances of breaking that cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And so we have to, you know, not only ensure that um, that low-income communities have access to resources, but they have to be resources that they need. All right. Let's talk about the economic impacts of being poor. Yeah, um, this is such a deep subject. And I know that we are seeing more and more economic impacts during this pan time of pandemic, you know, because of so many people have experienced job loss. And so let's 
keep about keep a couple of these things um, in mind as we consider again the creation of a theory of change. We know, and this has been very true, um, that if you have uh, a condition or if you're ill, you may delay visiting your doctor um, because you it's the cost um, of visiting your doctor is extremely expensive for most of us. Um, I think the one thing that many um, physicians are alarmed is that they're seeing their emergency room visits drop dramatically over the last couple of months, probably because of fear is part of it. But what's going on with these individuals that aren't seeking these services? Um, you know, and again, part of it is is not only fear of getting um, COVID, but also that idea is, well, I don't have even any extra money to even think about going to the ER or seeing my doctor because I simply do not have the money available to try to pay them. Um, the other thing to think about too is um, homelessness shelters. Um, homeless shelters, uh, these uh, shelters are typically expensive to run. Um, they don't address um, the long-term solution for people who experience homelessness. It really just solves that immediate problem. And we know that if some studies have been done, and I think it was in Nevada that has had a relative good success rate of providing housing, supportive housing for people who experience homelessness. And they, when they crunched the numbers, they realized that they were saving an extraordinary amount of money and those individuals who were housed were actually um, receiving services. And so some of the issues that created them, uh, that, that created the conditions of homelessness for them began to go away. That's an interesting study. Yeah, the, check it out sometime. It's, it is pretty fascinating. And actually it was a correlation of, um, it, they correlated in um, ER visits as well. So again, thinking again about more economic impacts, that, that poverty in one neighborhood does affect the entire community. And it really does. And, you know, we just say, we well, you know those, and I know that um, I grew up ne in, near Peoria and, you know, I knew I, from what people would say where, where the poor neighborhood was, um, which was really, when I think back on that, I'm like, wow, I can't believe that we actually talked about it. And secondly, that did impact the community because that was an area um, that experienced higher crime. It again, was a food desert, you know, so there was lack of access to a grocery store or grocery stores. Um, and transportation um, was really not really present in, in that area of that community. Um, also, we also understand that sometimes the, we see increased crime in unsafe neighborhoods, which really leads to a lack of productivity in that neighborhood. People don't want to go outside. They stay inside. Um, we see um, individuals may not want to leave their house to, to work because of fear. Um, so there's a, a lack of uh, income. And then there's also this notion of underdeveloped human capital creates needs, which puts a strain on government resources. And that's exactly right, because if individuals um, don't have a job or are unable to gain experience or receive training to become employed, then that may um, cause a deeper strain on resources. You know, and it's this isn't, you know, the solution that we always hear about um, solving poverty is, well, you can just get a job. And but that is simply not true. Yeah, Christine, when I saw this slide for the first time, it reminded me of two movies that I, I've um, watched, Gran Torino and Precious. And even though they're fiction, they really do a good job of representing how poverty feeds poverty, poverty feeds crime, um, it talks, and, and they address the underdeveloped human capital that some of the characters in the movies try to rise above. It's not an easy road for so many people. They're fighting not just themselves, but an entire environment, an entire lifestyle that they have to rise above. It's not so easy to get a job if you're um, a minority in a, in a location where uh, some people would not hire you just for that reason or if you don't have the, a nice suit for the job interview or you lack you had to drop out of school because it was more important to put food on the table and so you, you don't have the education it, it's more than just go get a job and you'll get out of poverty 
Right. That's exactly right. And I also think, you know, and, and you mentioned it, but they're all, you know, in many communities, um, there are issues of racism and discrimination. And so, again, we need to have those conversations about becoming um, culturally competent and how is it that we can work better in collaboration with one another. So this, um, there are different kinds of poverty. And um, for those of you who have been to trainings, um, and I had, a, had actually included this in a, a webinar, the, the webinars that we do on Friday, is that there are, there are different kinds of poverty. If you are an individual who has grown up generationally poor, that your parents were poor, your mom was poor, your grandmother was poor, um, her mother was poor, then that means the, that really has embedded um, generational poverty. So life, life perspectives may be a bit different. This is really what Donna Beagle predicates quite a bit of her work on. She grew up generationally poor, um, and she talks about the things that they valued. They valued uh, togetherness, um, really working together as a family. Um, education was not high on the list um, because they were very much focused on becoming and gaining and keeping employment so they can survive. Um, so thinking about generational poverty. Um, also, there's um, this idea of situational poverty. Um, this is something that we're probably, ex people are experiencing more now than ever. Again, be referencing back to those high unemployment numbers, many people um, work in the gig economy. You know, that's like being your Uber drivers or your Grubhub deliverers, um, in which those are may maybe not operating right now. Um, so those jobs are no longer present. Um, and those individuals, too, that work that don't earn a, a, a living wage, they don't have a living wage job. Um, that's our reality, too. And so we need to think about poverty from multiple perspectives. It is not poverty is not a one size fits all everybody. And they, people experience poverty very differently. So this is when you, um, you so you, you've kind of visited this idea of, or revisited this, this question of what does poverty look like in our communities and what are some of the different types of poverty that are experienced. Now we need to move into that conversation of what should be, what can be changed or maintained. All right, so what is in your power to change? I know in some uh, agencies, a very common issue is finding housing or finding employment for felons. You can't change the criminal record, but can you advocate for a change in the landlord's policy if the crime was five years ago with no subsequent charges? Can you ask for an exception from a prospective employer if the clients held the same job for three years with a good record? So be, be mindful of what you can change and what you can't change but you know what, we're all about change, making things better. So what, uh, any problems, any uh, needs that your community has, how can we address those and make things um, better? But we also have a neutral change when we prevent something from uh, getting worse. Uh, consider a family who's in subsidized housing. They're very satisfied with their situation. They might not have a goal of owning a home. They're happy to stay where they are because it's safe, affordable, comfortable, and keeping them there can be an outcome. It's not really a change, it's, it's a neutral change because uh, they're just staying there. And, and that can be a goal, it absolutely could be an outcome. Yeah, absolutely, and I think, again, because remember, we think back to the three national goals, the word stability shows up in the, that, that very first goal. Yeah. And so if, if you have that capacity at the agency to help the family remain stable, then that is a successful outcome. Not getting your electricity shut off would be a neutral change. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. So, you know, so here is just a, a bit of a matrix um, about maintaining stability. And so you, and you'll see that these really do have the elements of what stability looks like. If you've lost your lack of access to um, food programs, um, which will reduce uh, the food supply or the, as you mentioned, the loss of utility service or risk of eviction or foreclosure. 
um, you're risking the loss of any housing benefit or the risk of the loss of health insurance. And so look at those outcome statements. They're all about maintaining, maintaining, and then the service is assistance with applications or, tan or service to tangible assistance. Is there a rent payment? Was there a utility voucher given? Was there a food box? So again, we can't, you know, we, we want to be aspirational and aspiring to have a family or an individual remain stable is aspirational. Right. Your agency might not provide health insurance, but you probably can provide some services that will enable the family to maintain the health insurance that they have right now through budgeting or education, whatever it takes. Right. And again, how will you know? This is really Roma 101. Um, but again, it's important to consider this when you're thinking about this development of a theory of change. Oh. Shameless plug number five. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're growing. What number should we try to, what should we shoot for? <laughs> um, are, 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 what are our outcomes on that? We want more more Roma professionals. Um, so what? how will you know? So what indicators will measure progress? So that's really a, a great conversation to have. How do you know when someone is being successful? And then what evidence do you need that identifies that the outcome has occurred? You know, and again, we've talked about this in past webinars, but again, this is where this, these conversations really have to come together when you are considering using a local theory of change or building a local theory of change. Yes. And Christine, it's important to remember that um, evidence is not what service was provided. The evidence is the change or perhaps stability. An indicator of success would not be handing out a scholarship. An indicator of success is proof of a diploma or certificate, a change in knowledge. That is your indicator of success. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you for those great examples. And the other thing to think about then too is results across the entire agency. And this is again, this is a key conversation to have when you're considering building this local theory of change because CSBG has a myriad of services and strategies um, that are embedded within the structure of that program. But you probably, since you work at a community action agency, you have a LIHEAP program, you have weatherization programs you probably have a transportation program that could perhaps be funded in part by CSBG, but probably has other funding sources. Um, you could have uh, services to seniors that could be congregate or home delivered meals. Um, we're seeing, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, the foster grandparent programs, you have Head Start. Uh, so we have to look at results across the entire agency. And we've talked again in past webinars about silos. And this is an opportunity to really have that broader cross um, program across sector, if you will, a conversation at the agency, because you want to really grab the results from the all the programs that are functioning at the agency. So when you're looking at the theory of change in the big picture, um, the, to me, the, one of the most important questions, have we ended poverty yet? I mean, we've been asking that question, what, since 1964, right? When we were charged um, to end poverty or at least to address the uh, impact of poverty. Right. And so what we have ended up, some of us doing um, is we have really built a structure um, of basic services and rather than you know expanding it and looking at it from a broader perspective we just kept filling our bucket up with offering basic services now there's nothing wrong with basic services you know if you're on maslow's hierarchy that's exactly where you need that that provides a level of stability is to provide basic services absolutely um, but what can you do that goes beyond that that goes deeper into it um, so you'd want to think about family poverty and then you want to think about community poverty 
and again, this is not a, don't take this graphic um, at, at, at its word. This is just an example. So what does the family need? Well, the family does need basic needs, but perhaps another prevailing need is that housing or some sort of shelter is needed. Um, so that becomes an overarching program that you work within, and you could see where it would fit together. But also you have to think then, okay, if basic needs and shelter is one of them, what's in the community? Is there adequate um, and safe affordable housing in the community? Um, so safety becomes an issue. Are there jobs? So individuals can become employed or have access to employment. And are there schools available? So your children can have access to education. So we see kind of the difference in structure here. It, and I, you can make the argument, well, that looks a little silo-y to me. Um, but the reality is, is that these all need to work in collaboration with one another. So now we want to look at some theories of change that some of our peers out there in the big world of community action have created. Um, this is one from New York. Um, this is the Southern Tier Kids on Track. Um, this is a theory of change that has a lot of words in it. <laughs> it does have a lot of words. Yes. But you see, you see kind of the idea of where they're going. They're moving from inputs to mutually reinforcing activities um, to intermediate outcomes and um, requisite conditions. And then what is their social impact? And so we see the whole, we can track this. This really looks more like a logic model in some respects. Um, it does. It, yeah, it doesn't really have the, the problem issue, if you will, um, the need statement there. But again, we're thinking about how to keep kids on track and how are you going to do this from these multiple different places. Yeah, this is a map. So your stakeholders or your staff can see the big picture plan that your services are implemented, their the results are achieved, um, they have continuous communication for evaluation and assessment. This one is very wordy, but if it works for that agency, that's fine. If it whatever works, and if this is what they want, this is what they use, that's fine. We'll see some other ones that aren't quite so. Uh, it's tiny fonted. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. There's that. Right. So here's one from Wayne Metropolitan. That is the community action agency that serves uh, Detroit and the, the, the county that Detroit is in, Detroit, Michigan, I should say. Uh, or it's actually Wayne County, excuse me, Wayne Metropolitan's right in front of my nose. Um, so this one is a little bit different. Um, and it, it, really it is more of a story it has us, us it says join us on this road to empowerment and what i love about this is that you see those four signs that are on that highway that lead into the big city um, and it is connect engage build and thrive and i just love the those empowerment those are words of empowerment those are words of mission and vision it's it's really these are just pull out words that are that really create action for us as we look at this particular theory of change and you'll see in this one the mission and vision show up at the very top and these are great this is a great mission statement um, and if you have a vision statement at your agency use that vision statement that's an opportunity to really kind of kind of go deeper um, in, in an exploration of your mission um, and they're looking at three basic areas they're looking at family stability quality housing and economic opportunities and then you'll see that underneath that in the grassy area um, they have all of their services and strategies in place there and then at the bottom they are really are really discussing what their how, what their strategies are which are quality services capacity building and operational excellence so again we see kind of that's the foundation that's supporting all the rest of the work on the road to empowerment And on uh, the next slide we have, uh, you'll see that we're getting even simpler. Uh, this is a simpler theory of change. It addresses communication, data-driven decision-making, services, outcomes. It's an overview of what they want to achieve and how they'll get there. Um, I support simplicity. 
but I'd really like to see their mission statement to evaluate that their graphics represent their implementation and achievements. Um, I think their ideas are great, um, but this one is more graphic and less text. Um, and I, you know what, if it works for them, then that's what matters. Central Missouri, if you like it, go for it. Um, I would want to see a mission statement and uh, s some sort of focus on uh, on what they're trying to achieve here. Although, you know what, it's nice looking. I like the color coding, concentric circles, and then the, the clarification, whatever works. If it works for them, then I'm happy with it. Yeah, and I, I think that's, I think you've really hit on the key piece. If it works for them, then that that's great. And I will say, um, this was featured in a webinar, national webinar last week, um, and what Central Missouri had done, and I think it's an exciting opportunity for us to explore here in Illinois, is that that it is a um, fairly large community action agency that covers a big chunk of Central Missouri, many, many counties, and it also includes Jefferson City and um, Columbia. And they decided uh, two years ago that they were going to switch their whole processes into family-centered work um, and coaching. And so how did they get started? One thing that they did is that they developed this theory of change. Um, and what they've done, um, and this is, they also have a very large Head Start program. They have over 230 employees, but they were to get every, they got everybody on board from beginning to what they're doing now, and they have seen a dramatic change in many of the outcomes that they are reporting on. So this is, you know, these are uh, times for us to examine and think about change, and developing that theory of change would be a key piece in driving this idea forward of revisioning how agencies provide services to help people move towards stability. Um, so we just want to kind of put a kind of put another pin in this um, question about services and strategies. That this is a good time to have those conversations. You know, what do we say? What did we say in our community action plan? Are we are we doing exactly what we think we need to do? What does the assessment data tell us? And you also want to think about the agency's strategic plan. Again, this is a these are two of the most critical documents that you have and should be using if not on a daily basis, certainly visiting frequently um, to see if you are kind of checking in to see, okay, are we are we doing what our plan said that we're going to do? Um, did our strategic plan indicate that we were going to, you know, uh, solve this issue of family stability in our community or address this issue of, you know, creating more opportunity for stability in the community? And to be able to ask these questions and, again, run through some of the assumptions that you make when you're doing this work. So how how do you get started? That's the that's the question, right, Susan? How do how do we get started with this? How do you get started? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things to think about um, as you're doing this, um, you know, and I call this the conscious weave because you know that's the thing that we do in community action. Um, we're not unconsciously weaving. We have all these elements that we need to now blend together to really think through what it is that we have available to us. Um, from our funding sources in our what what do what do our plans say to really think about how we're going to shift and really focus on this theory of change so you have to first consider your connections to these national goals um, we saw them earlier here they are again um, but also to kind of consider this and you know I'm all about making lists um, so you really do want to involve um, the board members at the agencies in these conversations and this is where the Roma professional um, really I think brings such a beautiful perspective um, to the conversation and understanding what performance you know looks like and what the what how to do some data analysis and really deepen that opportunity to that conversation about change at the agency so is this going to be shameless plug number six? It, it is number six. Uh, Roma, <clears throat> shameless plug number seven, helps you, uh, Roma can help you take a conscious and dedicated look at your mission, your goals, your services, your linkages, mm -hmm. and most importantly, your results, as well as we can assist you with the documentation of those results. So that's where you get started by having a Roma training 
and okay. we're happy to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think some of the, the, the other things that you need to consider is maybe building a map of your services and programs. I know one thing that we undertook several years ago at the association is that we put together process maps for CSBG, LIHEAP, and weather. Um, that might be, and I think everybody got one. If you didn't, let me know, and I, I can see if I can get one to you. Um, but to look at those maps and see, okay, how, how are we doing in functionality? Are there some things that maybe we can start blending together um, or things that we can improve upon? Are there some efficiencies here that we can consider? Um, also, this is a, a time that perhaps to think about whole family approaches. We are hearing more and more information, um, certainly from the Community Action Partnership about whole family. I know Tiffany Marley and Jeannie Chaffin um, at the partnership are certainly promoting this use and are really reporting on the success of the, of the whole family approach. Um, have conversations with staff about stability and the outcomes that support stability. Again, that that is the goal, right? Stability, we look at goal one, there it is. There's that word, stable. Um, never be afraid to ask for help. Um, that's where, you, again, your Roma professional comes in. Um, and then there is the NASCAS framework for building a theory of change, and that is also attached as a handout on this webinar. Um, and this is just a model um, that Barbara Mooney had put, to, or excuse me, Jeannie Chaffin had put together um, to really kind of help us. And this might be a place to start. So if you're going to take a picture of a slide, this is the one that I would recommend you take a picture of. Um, but you see at the top are the community problems, the family problems, the agency problems. Then you move into what your strategic commitments are. What are the outcomes? You think about the outcome first. And then... Um, excuse me, after you've discussed the problem, then you jump to the outcome. And then what's, when you've figured out what that outcome is, then what are the indicators? What are some of the strategies and programs that we need to have in place to make this work happen? This is a really simple way to look at how we work together. And our, our ultimate goal is not to have programs. Our ultimate goal is to have outcomes and but but it takes steps to get there and this shows that mm -hmm. so moving forward a couple of things um, for you to think about um, in the development of a theory of change and again as a part of roma next generation what about the agency's big picture how does it all fit together that's um, what i love about this work that we do in community action it really is connected to one another um, we oftentimes, again, because of our funders and the way our funding streams come to us, it may seem very separate, but honestly, it is all for the same purpose. It fulfills the mission of the agency. So when you are getting ready for your community needs assessment, make sure that you use the agency uh, strategic plan and develop the community action plan with change in mind. Again, change and change could be keeping individual stable, just to, again, put a pin in that once again. So thinking about the approach, what sort of programming do you need in place? What's the data collection look like? How are we going to report this? And the evaluation, again, it's really working that Roma cycle. So anybody, and I haven't seen a question or a comment come across, Susan. Not a single one. So come yeah. on, ask us your question. Yeah, so we we could, um, we, we love to answer questions. Um, it's something that I think we're both pretty good at. I tend to ramble more than Susan. I don't know if anyone has noticed that. Um, but are there any questions out there? How can we help you? So you do have um, my contact information. I know that we have shared Susan's in the past. Um, so if you should have any questions about Roma, any element of the implementation of Roma, um, we're more than happy to have those conversations with you. Um, again, and here is shameless plug number eight, is it? Eight. Eight. Mm -hmm. um, again, um, once we are back and resuming um, operations, we don't know quite what that all looks like for all of us yet. It will be probably different uh, across the state. But we would be more than happy to visit you, um, to provide training for you, and to provide some insight into the work that you do. And, and materials. Absolutely, materials. And we have a brand new introduction to Roma manual that we're just itching to um, get trained on. So um, we're very excited about that. 
And so um, still not seeing any questions. Maybe if I sh uh, shut up for a minute or so, that <laughs> might help. Well, I'm really glad you joined us. Um, this, again, uh, will be available on YouTube at the IACA, uh, what do you call that, channel? It's, it's on our YouTube channel, right. Uh-huh, the IACA, um, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, better yet, uh, once we can meet face-to-face, -face, have Christine or me or another one of the Roma trainers in Illinois come to your agency and train your entire agency, or better yet, uh, one program. Uh, we can make it much more specific to that program. Uh, let us know. We're happy to do that. Uh, it can only benefit you. It just puts everybody on the same page. I know that you're doing good work. This is just a way to focus it and document it. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to express my appreciation um, to everybody who's on this webinar today, those who are watching them on YouTube. Uh, we're excited to present this information to you. Um, and we hope that you're finding it helpful. And I have to give a shout out once again to Susan. Um, I was teasing her yesterday that she puts up with me. And um, that is really the, the truth. Um, <laughs> she, uh, the, it's my pleasure to work with you, Christine. Yeah, and it is a pleasure to work with you, Susan. Again, you bring, I think, such a, a beautiful um, element um, to this conversation. And again, you are you are implementing Roma at your agency. You're training your agency. I know that um, you have found some creative and inventive ways to do that. Not just your uh, the staff members, but the boards, uh, your your agency board. So these are these are some practices that we want to embed at every agency throughout the state of Illinois. So thanks everybody. Um, thanks for joining yeah, us. Take good care out there, and uh, we'll hope to see you soon. Probably next week in the same space. Take care. Same Bye -bye. time, same station. Bye. <laughs>